I'm Timothy Shaw, Associate Director of the Religious Freedom Project uh, here at Georgetown University. The Religious Freedom Project is a part of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Uh, and it is, I believe, as Tom Farr noted uh, today, the only uh, university-based center in the world, as far as we know, that's devoted exclusively to, to interdisciplinary inquiry uh, about religious freedom, what it is and why it's crucial for the flourishing of individuals and societies everywhere. And let me uh, thank again uh, our partners who have made the Religious Freedom Project uh, possible. First, the John Templeton Foundation, uh, as well as the Institute for Studies of Religion uh, and Baylor University. We're very grateful to them. Uh, and uh, let me again welcome all of you to this exciting conference on sharing the message, proselytism and development in pluralistic societies. Uh, let me immediately acknowledge uh, and thank my Berkeley Center colleague, uh, Catherine Marshall, uh, who is head of the World Faith Development Dialogue over uh, to my far left. Uh, Catherine has uh, been instrumental in uh, working with us to make this conference possible. Uh, Catherine is among uh, the world's leading, if not the world's leading expert on the intersection of faith and development. I can hear Rick Warren saying amen right next to me. I met her at Davos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. well, that means a lot coming yeah. from, uh, yeah. from this man. Uh, let me also uh, just thank um, uh, some of my own students uh, in my own class here at Georgetown that I see in the audience. Uh, I, I'm, I see a few of them here. I'm grateful that they allowed me to proselytize them into coming to this conference. <laughs> uh, especially, you used the word uh, I'm especially grateful that uh, uh, they came, given the methods that I used were not entirely ethical. Um, and there may have even been some subtle and not so subtle forms of inducement and, and coercion. Uh, but but the, so you're here, thank you. Uh, and I'm especially grateful to the rest of you who are here entirely of your own free will. Uh, and volition. There was no inducement or coercion. You're here just because you wanted to be. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's great to have all of you. And if you're here, uh, you're here uh, because you want to be part of a serious discussion of some serious issues uh, with outstanding uh, globally recognized leaders uh, in the area of faith and development. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for being here. And if I may, I'd like to set the stage uh, by talking about some of the global dynamics that make a conversation about proselytism and development so important and timely and relevant uh, right now. First, we live in a world of enormous religious dynamism and vitality and creativity. The world, despite what sociologists 50 and 100 years ago uh, were saying, the world is not becoming a more secular world. It is not proceeding along some linear path of secularization. Instead, all around the world, we're seeing the revitalization of religion and religious movements with public and political consequences all over the world. Witness, just to take one example, the st uh, striking, uh, sweeping victory of the Bharatiya Janta Party in Indian elections last year, the largest Hindu nationalist, uh, 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 one of the largest religious nationalist movements uh, in the world in India, swept uh, parliamentary elections in India last year with an outright majority. There are many, many, many other examples that could be named of the, re of the vitality and the public uh, activism of religious movements all around the world. So one, we live in a world of, of, of growing religious dynamism and vitality. Second, uh, as the great sociologist of religion Peter Berger uh, has observed, the modern world, rather than growing in its secularity, is nonetheless growing in, a, in its plurality, uh, in, in pluralism. Uh, we are witnessing a deep and growing plurality or pluralism. There is growing and intensifying contact and, and interaction between people with different religious and philosophical beliefs. And this doesn't just mean that religious people are confronting other religious people. Uh, the growth of pluralism also necessarily, as Peter Berger has emphasized, means an increase in the number of people of, of, of any and all religious opinions, including uh, people who consciously disavow religion altogether. We're seeing in many countries a, a growth uh, in, in the ri or a, a rise of the nuns, uh, that is N-O-N-E-S. Uh, I don't mean a rise in female religious vocations, N-U-N-S. I mean a rise in nuns, uh, people who, who disclaim any particular religious affiliation. We see this across Western countries. We see this in other, many other countries uh, as well, Brazil uh, and others. More and more people with different religious beliefs and, and, and with no religious beliefs are talking to each other, interacting with each other in our world. 
uh, lots of different people are confronting lots of other different people in conversation and, and dialogue. The result, as Peter Berger says, is that everyone is talking to everyone. Uh, this has potential upsides because there are more religious options, uh, more religious choices that we have. We also can learn from each other. People of different beliefs can combine beliefs from different traditions in new and unexpected ways, creating the possibility of innovation and progress, just as 13th century Christians mixed Christian theology with the philosophy of Aristotle, uh, just as 19th century Hindu reformers uh, mixed uh, Hindu ideas with Western philosophical, uh, religious, and political ideas. We might also, as we interact with each other across these conceptual divides, get some strange hybrids that may or may not be a sign of progress. One such strange hybrid I came across the other day when I glanced at the website of the First Unitarian Congregation of Toronto. In a section on its website called Unitarian Humor, the following riddle was posed. What do you get when you cross a Unitarian Universalist with a Jehovah's Witness? The answer, somebody who comes knocking at your door for no apparent reason. I hope, I hope there are no Unitarians or Jehovah's Witnesses in the, in the audience, or I'll probably get a call from President DeJoya. But, um, um, so, so, in other words, religious pluralism uh, brings unexpected and sometimes unpleasant consequences, such as people proselytizing for no apparent reason, or uh, for reasons that we might find, find offensive. Uh, so religious pluralism brings the possibility of mutual learning and the fruitful mixing of beliefs, but it also brings the possibility of growing misunderstanding growing distrust, growing tension, growing mutual incomprehension, growing conflict, and even the potential of growing strife and violence as we're witnessing around the world over religious differences between religious communities. Uh, and as Ashoka Bandarage and others uh, have emphasized in the earlier panels, we're seeing the rise of religious extremism, sometimes by people who are not comfortable with the growth of religious pluralism around the world. Finally, the third a key global dynamic and fact that sets the stage for our conversation today is that we live in a world of enormous poverty uh, and terrible, desperate degradation. Unlike me, all of the uh, other people on this uh, panel, all of these three world-class experts uh, who've joined me on this stage are genuine experts on this last phenomenon, the fact that we live in a poor, very poor, very fragile, very desperate world. Nearly one half of the world's population, more than three billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. More than 1.3 billion people live in extreme poverty, less than $1.25 a day. One billion children worldwide live in poverty. According to UNICEF, 22,000 children die each day due to poverty, 22,000. 805 million people worldwide do not have enough food to eat, more than 750 million people lack adequate access to clean drinking water. Diarrhea caused by inadequate drinking water, sanitation, and hand hygiene kills an estimated 842,000 people every year globally, or approximately 2,300 people per day. These three global facts, uh, growing religious vitality, growing pluralism, and growing poverty, constitute the background to our conversation right now. Uh, and uh, they, they urge, uh, raise these facts, a, a number of very urgent questions. How can we harness the world's enormous and growing religious dynamism uh, in ways that can alleviate uh, this desperate poverty uh, that we see in so many contexts without exacerbating conflict and misunderstanding? How do we harness the incredible ingenuity and moral energy and dynamism of so many religious communities, Saddleback Church, uh, uh, World uh, Vision, uh, American Jewish World Service, uh, Samaritan's Purse, Islamic Relief, Catholic Relief Services? How do we harness the ingenuity, the moral passion, the religious vision of these and other organizations so as to address the world's desperate poverty and suffering without increasing mistrust and misunderstanding and even conflict between religious groups. And in particular, how do we harness and channel and focus, if I may, the proselytizing and missionizing energy of religious groups in ways that will lead to a net gain in our ability to solve the desperate human problems of development rather than a net loss? After all, it, it seems clear that on some issues, 
with respect to some very basic and important human development problems, problems such as inequality between men and women, problems such as unequal education for girls, problems such as female genital cutting, problems such as sex-select abortion, it seems clear that on many of these issues, it's not enough just to bring material development or opportunity, but in, in many, many cases, people's hearts and minds have to be changed. Uh, and yet, how do we do this in ways that don't uh, uh, foster distrust uh, and misunderstanding uh, and increase tension uh, and conflict? So these are really, really tough questions uh, because it's not clear how we balance uh, uh, the, the goods and, and the imperatives and the principles at stake. How do uh, faith-based groups working in development bring the hope and dignity they feel called to bring as a matter of religious duty while also showing respect to the needy and the vulnerable uh, and respect for their indigenous beliefs and without unnecessarily uh, uh, sowing seeds of division uh, and mistrust? How do we respect the religious freedom of groups that believe they are called to intentional witness uh, and the religious freedom of people who want to change their beliefs while also not exploiting the vulnerability of poor people? It's hard to think of more difficult questions. It's hard to think of more important and relevant questions. But thankfully, it's hard to think of, of people better suited to addressing these questions than the people you see uh, here uh, on the stage. Uh, I would first like to introduce uh, my colleague, as I mentioned earlier, Catherine Marshall. Uh, Catherine Marshall and I will uh, co-moderate uh, this panel conversation. Uh, and again, I'm grateful to Catherine for uh, being instrumental in, in making this event happen in, in every aspect uh, of this event. And as I said earlier, Catherine Marshall is among the, if not the, world's leading expert on the nexus of faith and development issues. She's a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, where she leads the center's program on religion and global development. After a long career in the development field, including several uh, major leadership positions at the World Bank, uh, Catherine Marshall uh, moved to Georgetown in 2006, where she also serves as a visiting professor in the School of Foreign Service. She helped to create, uh, when she was at the World Bank, working with James Wolfenson and the then Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, uh, the World Faith Development Dialogue, and she now serves uh, as its executive uh, director. Sitting to my immediate left uh, is Pastor Rick Warren, and we're delighted to welcome Pastor Rick Warren back uh, to Georgetown. Uh, you, some of you may remember that he was here uh, two years ago uh, where we had a wide-ranging conversation in Gaston Hall about religious freedom, uh, its importance, uh, the way in which, as Pastor Warren put it, it is the civil rights lib uh, issue of the 21st century, uh, and we're so grateful that he has come back uh, to be with us. Rick Warren is the founding pastor of Saddleback Church, a non-denominational California megachurch. Uh, he's a leading author uh, uh, very well known for a book that I suspect uh, virtually everyone in this room has heard of, The Purpose Driven Life, uh, which was reissued uh, in, a, in a second edition a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, Pastor Rick has staked out positions and supported programs that address a wide range of policy and development issues, including poverty, education, HIV, AIDS, uh, working both nationally but increasingly internationally, as he told us last time he was at Georgetown. Uh, worked, working increasingly in Africa and Rwanda and, and other countries. Uh, during the 2008 presidential election, he hosted candidates, uh, Senators uh, Barack Obama and John McCain for a public forum at Saddleback Church, and then he subsequently gave the invocation uh, at the inauguration of President Obama in January 2009. Time and U.S. News and World Report have recognized Warren as one of the most influential Christian leaders in the U.S. And uh, Ruth Messenger, very great, grateful to have you, Ruth, uh, uh, with us, uh, hosted uh, uh, by uh, Georgetown. Uh, Ruth has been the president of American Jewish World Service, the world's leading Jewish organization working to end poverty and realize human rights in the developing world since 1998. In addition, uh, Ruth currently sits on the US State Department's Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group and co-chairs the sub-working group on social justice she previously served on the Obama administration's task force on global poverty and development. Before coming to the American Jewish World Service, uh, Ruth spent 20 years in public service in New York City. 
uh, uh, for which service in 2006 she received the Albert D. Chernin Award from the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Uh, and that work also, I should say, specifically recognized uh, and honored her for her work to address the conflict in Darfur, uh, about which she has been very active. The Jewish Daily Forward, Jerusalem Post, and Huffington Post have named her on the list of the world's most influential Jewish leaders and most influential religious leaders of any background. Uh, Ruth earned a bachelor's degree from Radcliffe College and a master of social work degree from the University of Oklahoma. We're going to uh, ask uh, our panelists a series of questions and then enable you to, to jump in with your own questions. And the first question is actually a very simple one. Uh, uh, Ruth and Rick were actually uh, both uh, with us ever since the conference started. Uh, and we want to ask both of you whether you have any comments or reactions to what you've heard uh, so far, and then we'll uh, get into other, other questions. Ahead, uh, um, I, I do, Tim, and thank you. First of all, I want to thank um, the Berkeley Center in Georgetown for doing this, and I thought the morning panels were really impressive were. and raised a lot of good issues. And I want to comment on them. Um, if you will, give me one minute to sort of tell you how I'm approaching all of this. Yeah, so my um, approach, and I would have to say right up front, my objection to the problem of, of, of combining proselytizing and development aid is really based on two things. One is a, a fierce personal, and for me at least, faith-based view of development as needing to be bottom-up and community-led. And I'll come back to that at great length later. And the second one, which just I thought I should put out early, is that I'm from a faith not the way many of you may think about the Jewish faith in the 21st century, but I'm from a faith that's had millennia of experience with coercion, of being threatened with violence, of being required to convert in order to survive. And that historical experience uh, covers, colors a great deal of what I think about the particular issue today. I'm going to come back to both of those things, but in terms of this morning, I heard a lot of great things. I want to just pick up on two and leave them to you and Catherine for questions. One was this question, which was really nicely posed in the last panel, about uh, if you want something to happen, if you see something as a good, ending female genital cutting, family planning, then aren't you imposing that on the group that you're trying to help? And so what I want to say, and I'll talk at great length about this later, is you might be doing that, but in our experience, it doesn't work. So you want those changes. The good news is that there are people in every country, in every community, in every urban slum, in every rural area who have stepped forward and are questioning some of the practices that may actually be dictates of their faith or may be somewhat perceived to be dictates of their faith, but they're not really. But the people, just to pick up on one example, because you both mentioned it, the people who made the radical change in the practice, ending the practice of female genital cutting in Senegal were women who got the notion that this was a practice that needed to change. And the importance of talking about the Senegal example is that they converted, and I'm using that word unfairly, <laughs> deliberately, they converted an imam to support their point of view, which made a huge difference. So those are stories, but I just think that you can't tell people that they should be doing something different um, until you find the people who are already thinking about making change. The other thing, which is I think for me going to be a, a sort of my theme point in this presentation, is there was not enough discussion. There was certainly some discussion, but for me, not enough discussion this morning of the power dynamic. The issue of proselytizing is one thing. The issue of proselytizing to people that you describe really nicely as half the world who have virtually no choices, that, that tremendously influences anything that happens in their communities. And people can say and mean that they're not expecting any conversions, that they're not asking for anything. But we hear over and over again in communities where we work, and by the way, I want to say in people that wrote me because they heard about this panel, and they wrote me to say, could you please raise this problem of our, of our faith group or this problem of our faith group because they feel as if, given the circumstances and given the power dynamic, the message is that they need to convert, that they need to change their faith behavior, that they need to abandon something or sign on to something else in order to continue to be recipients of aid or development help. Thank you, Ruth. Hmm. Good points. Uh, Rick? Good points. Well, first, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this. 
because it said, this is, these are very important issues we're talking about, and thousands of people chose not to come, <laughs> but you did. So it says you care, and so I just want to say I'm on the same team with you because you care about these issues. And second, I would like to, like Ruth said, thank those who spoke. There, I took pages of notes, and everybody who spoke taught me a lot. Um, I'd like to thank Tom and Tim for starting with history, the history of proselytizing and development. Because let's just remember that for 2,000 years, the church has been doing development longer than any government or any NGO. They inv the church invented the hospital, not a government, not an NGO. The church, you go to almost any nation in the world, the first school and the first hospital were started by missionaries, almost every nation in the world. So the, the hubris of now looking at suspicion of faith-based development is, is, is ignoring 2,000 years of history and, uh, and cultural development. All compassion, all compassion should be without strengths, period. If it's, if it's not unconditional, it's not compassion. So, so all compassion should be without strengths. Here's the problem. The government wants to hold faith-based organizations to a standard they it's themselves will not keep. Because if you want to talk about strings attached, look at our AIDS program. And we have a cultural agenda that we are now imposing all around the world. I have a philosophy of what I call co-belligerency, which means I can work with people I totally disagree with on things we agree about. We don't have to agree on everything to work together. For instance, my wife and I have given literally millions of dollars personally to help people with HIV and AIDS because of the Purpose Driven Life book. And so we worked for people with AIDS and, and uh, HIV all around the world, and yet the government won't work with organizations, for instance, that have problems with birth control. Now, I'm not a Catholic, but I can work with both LGBT and with Catholics and anybody else if you want to work on AIDS to prevent AIDS. That's a humanitarian issue. I don't have to agree with every issue that everybody agrees with. The government won't do that. The government is clearly having a strings attached developmental policy now promoting their view of culture around the world. The reason I know this is for the last 12 years, uh, we've been doing at Saddleback a thing called the Global Peace Plan, P-E-A-C-E, -E, which stands for uh, Promote Reconciliation in War Territories. E is Equip Ethical Leaders, which is an anti-corruption issue. A is Assist the Poor. C is care for the sick, and E is educate the next generation. And in the last 12 years, I've had 24,869 of my members in 197 countries. That's more countries than the United Nations has. And so I've been on the ground, and I've had a first chance look to see how our government does development with strings attached all around the world with its own cultural agenda. And so. I would I, I, thank you for asking about what everybody else said first. And I, I, I wrote down a couple thoughts. I just wrote them down here. All compassion should be without strings, but it doesn't mean it should be without motivation. Because everybody has a motivation. The day after the tsunami hit, Ashoka talked about the tsunami. I stood up at Saddleback Church and said, we need to help these people. And on that day, our one congregation gave $1.6 million in cash for the tsunami. Nine months later, the um, uh, Katrina hit. And I stood up and on a, literally a 30-second announcement said, we need to help these people. And they gave $1.8 million. We gave that no strings attached. We just gave it. But we did it because we love Jesus. I'm not ashamed of that motivation. You don't have to have that motivation. If you see, I have a people in a, if there's a fire going on in a house and their children burning on the inside, and five people run in to catch those kids. They might have five different motivations. I don't care what their motivation is as long as the kids get out safe. Somebody might have a profit. Businesses have a profit motivation. It's not my motivation for humanitarian work, but it's not a bad one. I don't have a, the United States has self-interest motivations in humanitarian work. It's not my motivation, but it's not a bad one. I was recently asked to testify before Congress on why 
it's cheaper foreign policy to give aid than to send troops. Well, duh. <laughs> okay, duh. And I, you know, I, of course, it's, that's not my motivation, but I'm not against it. I'm just interested in getting the job done. I think it's important that we define both development and proselytizing. First, development in itself without uh, proselytizing is controversial because it in involves change. I've seen forced development. I've seen coerced development. I've seen all kinds of development that was not religious in nature. That was purely coercion uh, that people didn't want. Uh, and then proselytizing. By the way, do you know where that word comes from? It's from the, Hebrew, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The Septuagint translation is where the word proselytizing comes. It's not in the English Bible. I don't like the word because it has such a negative baggage connotation today of coercion. I do like the word, somebody said it earlier, witness. I, I like that. And the Bible does say, be ready to give an answer to those who ask of you the hope, but do it with gentleness and respect. That's, that's my philosophy. So everybody has a motivation. And I would be very careful about, I think it was uh, uh, Bob who said, uh, who gets to be the motive police and determines why you're doing good, as if my version of doing good is better than your version of doing good. So I, I think that's an important. Another thing I wrote down just listening was that um, I think the greatest proselytizer today is the media, the media, uh, because they have far more far, uh, inf power and influence today in setting values and agenda than the church, the government, or anybody else. The religion of America is medianity, and, and they set, say it's at the agenda. I would say that the reason I do what I do is I, I believe that the church has a numerous advantages that no government and no NGO will ever have. I'm talking about local congregations. And when I talk about spiritual congregations, it could be a temple, it could be a mosque. We have done interfaith uh, in many places with Muslims, with Jews, and who, like I said, uh, working together on different issues. There, the church offers some things that the government will never, ever, 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 ever have in development. First, we have universal distribution. I could take you to 10 million villages around the world, there's nothing in it but a church. And I could take you to millions more that there's nothing in it but a mosque. Uh, it is the only form of social government outside of the cities in many developing countries. We have the most volunteers. Let's just put this in perspective. There are 600 million Buddhists in the world. There are 800 million Hindus in the world. There are about 1.5 million billion Muslims in the world. There are about 15 million Jews. There are 2.3 billion Christians in the world. Most of the world has a faith. The actual number of people who are agnostics and atheists is actually quite small outside of Europe and Manhattan. Uh, I, I was once on one of the panels, Tony Blair asked me to be on a panel at Davos, and, and I shocked everybody when I said, now you may not like this, but the future of the world is not secularism. It's pluralism. You may not like that, but if you're a businessman, you're going to have to learn to get along with it. How do you get along in a pluralistic world? And I believe in religious liberty because I believe everybody has a place at the table and may the best ideas win. I do not believe in coercion. I do believe in persuasion. People are trying to persuade me all the time. Environmentalists try to persuade me. Political parties try to persuade me. LGBT try to persuade me. Christians try to persuade me. Uh, 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 advertisers, everybody, teachers are proselytizing their kids, as you said, and parents are proselytizing their children. So this is a fact of life that everybody's trying to persuade everybody. We just need to make sure it's fair. 
Thank you, Ruth and Well, Rick I would both. add that yeah. that ends right where I was. I think the question is, um, just to that specific point, Pastor, is what's fair when one group has all the resources or all the power? Um, I appreciate what you said about the government, but I don't want to make that the standard, because that's not my standard. I know what issues my government has at play in um, its geopolitical life, and very often, from our point of view, um, US geopolitics dictates, and I might feel right about this as an American citizen, yeah. that their aid is to win hearts and minds at the top levels of a country, look for allies. But I know, and I know that our government knows, that a great deal of the aid that they deliver in that fashion doesn't go beyond the president or the prime minister or a few members of the cabinet, doesn't go to the people. So I'm talking very specifically about a different kind of development. And yes, I'm always trying to persuade and convince the US <laughs> government to support that kind of aid and development. But I want to speak sort of really for, for ourselves. And for me, it's this power relationship that, that so influences persuasion. Hmm. Now I need a moment of personal pleading here. Hmm. I come from Manhattan. <laughs> no, I apologize. I, I, serve, I served for eight years as the borough president of Manhattan, and at least for those eight years, the borough had a faith-based, faith-believing, synagogue-attending Jew who really cares about Jewish values. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, you ought to talk to that. Um, but I want to go back to, to um, this history, and I just have to note, and I know that there are about two of you in this room who have any notion of what I'm talking about, but we are actually on the eve of the Jewish holiday of Purim, a holiday which even if you knew what it was from the, from the public discourse, you wouldn't really know what it is <laughs> because of the way it's celebrated. And by the way, for those of you who'd like to adopt Judaism today, here's the, po <laughs> here's, here's the point of persuasion. It's the holiday on which you're directed to get as drunk as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I am not yet drunk. It starts tonight. <laughs> But, but I said that for a lot of laughing regard. If you read, actually, the book of Esther, which is the, which is the Purim story, um, it is premised around um, an advisor to the king yeah. who decided that for his own good and for the higher elevated status of the king, all the Jews in the kingdom should be killed. So that is not exactly a conversion story. It wasn't talking about converting. It was just talking about eradicating them. But it is this notion of picking on a religious minority. Right. And I loved, Tim, in your introduction, this question of, is this expanded pluralism going to lead to rising levels of tolerance, shared living and understanding, or increased tensions? So just as a, another marker out there, we all are going to have to deal, including our government, over the next, I'm sorry to say this, but over the next months, with a religious war that is um, rising in Western Burma, Myanmar for, to some people, yeah. um, where there is gross religious intolerance on behalf of one religious group attacking another religious group, and the government of that country not only isn't intervening, but really does seem to be on the side of the oppressors. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of a thousand examples mm -hmm. of like how are we going to create the war against the Rohingya Muslims, uh, right? The uh, yeah. war against the Rohingya mm -hmm. in uh, in Rakhine State in, in Western Burma. Uh, it's basically a war of fundamentalist Buddhists against Muslims. Um, it's got all kinds of roots in history. But again, for me, I want to go back to this issue of power. Because just one small example of what's happening in Rakhine State, the government of Burma, of Myanmar, having uh, pronounced itself, and I'm using those words deliberately, a democracy, because it's pretty much the same people who were part of the military autocracy, but having announced itself a democracy, has said that it will hold a census as a prelude to elections, which is exactly what, from the geopolitical or from the American point of view, we'd like to hear. But we know that in Rakhine State, the census takers are told to ask people when they go in their homes if they can't tell, and probably they can tell, but to ask them what their religion is. Hmm. And if people say Muslim, they leave without counting them. Hmm. That's a perfect example to me of power. It's a combination of government power and, and Buddhist power in this instance. But it's using power to literally to take the first step or the second step toward obliterating a people. If they don't exist, mm. then it's much easier to um, perpetrate violence against them. So I just feel, and again, I'm just going to say this you know, from, from my, I mean, I, I told you about Purim because it's fun. But from the history of the Jewish people, whether it's the Crusades or the Inquisition or the effort that I know some of you are familiar with in the last few decades, which has supposedly stopped, but not clearly, 
not clearly over, mm. the effort of the Mormons to convert Jews who are dead. I mean, that shows a real interest in um, conversion, I guess, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it's insulting, and it, it is a practice that we believe is still going on. So it's just, I mean, I come at this as somebody aware of the, of the history of her people with, with a real allergy to anybody using their power in any way. And in this case, Pastor, we're talking specifically about their power in the distribution of aid, their power in helping in development. And I don't disagree with what you said about the government, but it's just be clear what the power base is before you, um, before you move too fast. So how do we, as faith-based groups, I guess that's what I'd like to say, do everything we can to pull back from imposing who we are and how we choose to live our lives, which we would love for people to see and be impressed by, but how do we do, take that extra step to be sure that people don't think that the only way they can get aid, or in some cases, are told that the only way they can get aid is by signing on and changing. Because whatever that does in the short term, and it might produce more converts, and it might produce some great new adherence, but I guess, Tim, in my, in my experience, it's exactly what's going to lead to those rises in, in, in a religious tension. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. You both laid down some uh, excellent uh, opening uh, points, uh, as it were, some important markers for our conversation now. And I want to invite Catherine. Uh, Marshall, uh, we've uh, developed a little bit of a line of questioning uh, for you both to go even deeper into these issues, and I'll invite Catherine now to, to ask a, a series of questions. <laughs> well, you've all upset our line of yeah, questioning. Exactly. But, uh, well, it's uh, your fault uh, you uh, changed the first question. We were ready we're, to be well-behaved, both of us. You can imagine that, right? We're a bit, thrown, really we're a bit well thrown off people. now. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to add one sentence to Tim's introduction, which I think is as a global issue is something that's very important to keep in mind, which is that for the first time in human history, we have the possibility of ending poverty. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that poverty is increasing. Poverty is a scandal, but it's a scandal because we know we can end it. Yeah. So, so let that, that's the message of hope. Uh, and it's never happened before in human history, and it is a possibility now. So let me... Um, try to pick this up, Ruth. Um, I, I think it would be interesting if you could go a little bit deeper into the sort of Jewish dimension of uh, what lies behind American Jewish World Service, uh, Services approach, the community approach that you described before, uh, and what are the kinds of issues that you encounter on the ground, including the question that we talked about in the earlier panel, which is to what extent is this concern about proselytizing or evangelizing and strings attached, is it, is it exacerbating tensions in situations that you've seen? You've talked about the Rohingya, but other situations. Um, uh, so the short answer to the end of your question is I think yes. I think that people, um, people who live, who are part of, of Tim's three billion or billion and a half, people who are living with abject poverty and want help in many places in the world where some help has been provided are a little bit leery because they expect a string or two to be attached, sometimes because they experience the arrival of Westerners, they experience the arrival with great hope, and then they discover that the aid that's being offered or the service that's being provided is not what they think they need. And that creates its own and new source of tension, and I could give you lots of examples of that. The most dramatic recently, I think is a good one, maybe a lot of you saw it in the newspaper, but it's just a dramatic example because it's two huge needs in which one people, one, one, the givers had one priority and the receivers had the other priority. So the issue is bed nets for children with malaria. There's, everybody in this room would agree that that's an extraordinary need. This is a disease that we can wipe out if every child in the, in the world sleeps under a bed net. You would imagine that you could easily explain that to any parent and that it's only a question of how many bed nets you can bring into a village and who's gonna handle the distribution. From the point of view, which I hope you can also switch your mind to understand, it's like those pictures of do you see the, the profile or the, this profile or that profile, the people in several villages in Africa felt that their most acute need was to feed their families and fishing was slowing down. 
And here was a delivery of magnificent, perfectly designed fishing nets. <laughs> and so don't put your children under them at night, because what's the point of saving your child till morning if she has nothing to eat? Take the fishing nets, go and fish and bring the food back, and then you can think, after you've fed your family, probably the strongest instinct from any parent, about disease prevention. OK, and so here were the problems. Because the West in general, and I'm, I'm lumping a lot of people, a lot of groups into this, but didn't ask or weren't on the ground, we delivered, here's the key word, guys, insecticide-treated, fine mesh bed nets, that the villagers used to fish. So nobody knows, don't, don't stop eating healthy, but nobody knows whether the next fish you eat, or more to the point, whether the fish that those villager, villagers are now consuming are additionally contaminated, because nobody's ever studied the effect of impregnated bed nets on, um, on whatever. And much more importantly, from a development point of view, the tiny mesh on the bed nets designed to prevent the mosquitoes from getting in takes everything out of the ocean. So if you know anything about the ecology of fishing, all of the tiny plants, of uh, tiny animals, and all of the plants are swept up every time these nets are used. So the fishing industry will, effectiveness will plummet. I want to say that for, I can give you five examples like that. For me, that is, and I know how you asked the question, but that is what teaches us take seriously the Jewish commandment to pursue justice, and take seriously the Jewish understanding, it's B'Tzel Elohim in Hebrew, that every person is equally created in the image of God. If you believe that, then you would come to understand that the solutions to the problems of land grabbing in Cambodia, or fishing in um, Africa, or planting in uh, Mesoamerica, are going to come not from the World Bank, or from the American Jewish World Service, or from Saddleback, or from the United Nations, without the involvement of the people who live there. Absolutely. And over Absolutely. and over again, our experience as, as Jews, but also as development experts who've developed a niche for our development work, which is to find, and we would say we do a better job of this than many people, certainly than the US government, of finding the grassroots groups on the ground who have their own vision of justice and asking them what it is we can do to help. And if you start there, you find those people, and this was well addressed in the last two panels, but you find those people who want to make change. At Georgetown right now, a phenomenal university that I'm very fond of, there are some people thinking about how are we going to educate the next decade and the next decade. And they see some needs to make change in curriculum, in tenure, in, in scholarships. I don't know what. And you know what? A lot of people are just like, I like it the way it is. I won't be here in a decade or two. But in, this is true in every community. In the middle of Matari, where some of you have walked in an urban slum in Kampala, there are people who are saying, wait a minute. Things here need to be a little different. And if you ask them, then you get a level of leadership from the bottom up that makes it much more likely that the aid you provide will be used. And for me, going back to the broader theme today, <clears throat> that's an example of shifting the power dynamic. Because no one is, is uh, we are not in a position. Um, it is absolutely true that we choose who we want to help. So of course, we're acting on some of our values. I agree, grant you that. But we're helping in a way that leaves the people who live the heart of the problem in charge of the of the step by step solutions to solving it. You know, I actually saw that happen in Tanzania. The story that Ruth was telling about uh, everybody's using bed nets for fishing, and and it goes back to what I I think Kent said it or maybe Ahsoka said it. You just have to ask the people what they need. Uh, we never, ever assume we know what people need. In fact, one of the themes of the peace uh, uh, plan is we don't come to solve, we come to serve. Because we don't, we don't even know what you need. And we, uh, let me give you a case in point. When we went to Rwanda, we said, look, we specialize in these five things, corruption and poverty and you know, these five things. Uh, we have no idea what you need. What would you like us to do? And they said, Western province, 
two million people, one doctor. We need health care. I said, fine. So we, we said, fine, that's what we'll do, we'll help you with. So we went and uh, we surveyed and, and uh, later actually President Bush asked me to be the closing speaker at the malaria conference and I put a map up. I said, let me just show you why you have to have faith-based to solve any global problem. You can't do it. It's the third leg of the stool. You can't, if you could solve the world's problems with just business and government, we would have solved them by now. But as I said, the church has things that nobody else has, including 2.1 billion volunteers. And so I said, watch this. And I put up a, I said, here's the western province of, of I put up a map, western province of Rwanda, two million people, one doctor. By the way, here are the three hospitals. Okay. Now, not the hospitals like you would imagine, because they're not staffed. They're volunteers. And I said, uh, that's not, it's two days walk to the nearest health care. That's not good health care. I said, by the way, two of those three hospitals, they're faith-based. So you'd only have one of them if it wasn't faith-based. But that's not good enough health care. Then I said, here's the second slide. Put up 18 dots. I said, here are the 18 clinics in the western province of Rwanda. Now that's better because it's, uh, it's only one day's walk to the 18 clinics. And I said, but if you've been in these clinics, if you've ever been in any clinic in a developing country, you know, it's a bottle of aspirin on the shelf. I've been in those 18 clinics. Uh, one of them was a woman on the ground just giving birth to a baby. There was nothing there, just a roof. Another one was, uh, had a, stethoscope, a microscope from the 50s, no medicine. Uh, but it's better than nothing. And I, I said, so here are the 18 clinics. By the way, 16 of these 18 clinics, they're faith-based. They're in churches. So you wouldn't have those. You'd only have two if it weren't for that. I said, now watch this. And I put up a picture. And dot, 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 dot. I said, here are the 867 houses of worship in the Western province. Where would you like to get your health care? Two days walk, one day's walk, or five minutes away? Melinda Gates is sitting on the front row. She comes up and says, I get it. The church could be the distribution center. I said, Melinda, the church has been the distribution center for 2,000 years, long before anybody else thought about it. It was caring for the sick. Now, the key to poverty is not aid, it's trade. And what people need is jobs. These people are not dumb, they're smart. They just need a hand up, not a hand out. And the West has put enormous trillions and trillions of dollars in aid into the West, and many of those countries are actually worse than they were 50 years ago. And I have sat in front of presidents in Africa and said, when I come into the country, are you going to rip me off? And the president says, excuse me? And I said, we have the ability to bring in enormous resources into this nation, but if you're just going to put it in a Swiss bank account, you don't want me and I don't want you, and you just need to tell us right now. Because you've got to confront corruption head on. And if you don't hit it crap head on, then a lot of it's just going to get going into, uh, you know, the king's slush fund. But teaching people how to, to, to uh, you know, jobs is, is really the key to poverty. Now, everybody knows the old saying, don't give a man a fish, teach him to fish. And I say that's not good enough. You need to not just teach him to fish, you need to teach him how to sell a fish. Because you need to develop a market economy. If all you do is teach a man to fish, you produce a village of fishermen where everybody catches the same fish, sits on the side of the road, sells the same fish, one of them gets sold, other nine die, and they all go home hungry. What you need is somebody who says, I'll, I'll make the nets, I'll build the boats, I'll can the fish, I'll skin the fish, I'll preserve the fish, and you build a, 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 a mini economy. And that is a matter of training. And really what people need more than anything else is opportunity and training. I'm going to go back to Rwanda. In Rwanda, the average income for a farmer is 64 cents a day. He grows, grows coffee all day and makes 64 cents. At the end of the day, he can't buy a cup of Starbucks. That's, that's the power problem. So the really issue is going in as a servant. Going in as a servant means you don't go in with an agenda, you go in to serve. But uh, let me uh, try to ask you, Rick. By the to, way, let yeah, me just yeah. give you the follow-up on that, on that, that thing in South, uh, in the Western province. I said, I'm going to prove that I can do it faster than any NGO. So I went to the churches in the Western province and said, 
you're never going to have a doctor in your village because there aren't enough doctors in the world to put a doctor in. Every, you're never going to have a doctor. So we're going to have to train people in your church to do basic health care. Eighteen pastors said, well, I'm in. A couple priests, a couple Catholics, a couple Protestants and Pentecostal. All that. The Muslims came to me and said, uh, can we be in? I said, of course you can be in. This is not a, this is a humanitarian issue. Okay? So the Muslims, two of the Muslim uh, mosques said, each of you pick two people. And we began to train them in simple stuff. First, how to wash your hands, how to hang the sheets out to dry in the sun so they're, they're sanitized, how to do basic sanitation, how to dress a wound, then how to stitch a wound, then how to set a bone, and finally, how to administer ARVs, which is very technical and compliance for uh, antiretrovirals for AIDS. And we took those uh, uh, 32 people and we trained them and we gave them each seven families to visit a week. I said, you're going to make house calls. And then we had them help us train 64 and then 128, 246, multiply. Uh, last August, I went to uh, Kabuya Region District and held a rally for 6,000 trained healthcare workers who were each making seven visits a week to families. What did it cost me? Nothing, because it's not about money. It's not about money, it's about training. And that is the power of distribution. And I'm just saying, uh, we must involve all three layers. Business has a role, church has a role, uh, faith has a role, and um, government has a role. And but I'm just I, expanding on, on Pastor Warren. I just want to be sure, because I certainly agree that it's not just the public sector and the private sector that way, um, business and government. But I think when you get to what is that third leg or that third, fourth, fifth leg, I don't want it to be just civil society NGOs. I don't want it to be just faith-based organizations such as are represented here. I want to be sure that there's space for the voice of those people. So and it, that was a great story. And I guess the only thing I'd add to that is like a, is an almost parallel story, but it was over the last six months, American Jewish World Service asking our longtime grantees in Liberia, what is going to work here? Because my government has sent in 2,800 Marines and they've built, I don't forget the number, I think 30 Ebola treatment units. And my people on the ground tell me the Ebola treatment units are largely empty. First of all, there's no staff, yeah. your point. But second of all, and more importantly, the view of the average Liberian is that white guys and gals in spacesuits brought a dangerous virus here, um, and they expect us to take our sick family members to the hospital where we know there's no treatment and where the neighbor's child went last week and he's now dead. So we said to our people on the ground, what's the next step? And they said, so it's a nice parallel, but in this case it came from them. They said, we can't right now do the land rights work that you trained us for. But if you can get us information and advice, we know how to go door to door and tell people what you may not, what you in New York may not get. But they first have to be told the virus is real. Then they have to be told there are steps to prevent it. And then, and I want you all to think about this, each person in this audience, then they have to be told that every single thing that they ordinarily do to care for a sick member of the family or to bury a family member who's died will lead to rapid spread of the, of the virus and many more deaths. Now, whatever your faith in this room, whatever your common care practice for holding your child when she's sick, or for dropping everything and going to take care of your father because he's ill, or for being part of the family that buries your uncle, what if you were suddenly told by anybody you can't do any of those things, or you yourself will die and other people will die. And what if you were told that by people that you specifically didn't trust, including in Liberia, your own government? So how to make change has got to involve the people who live there orchestrating, orchestrating the steps. And I'm very happy to say, a small uh, uh, correction to what you said before, that in this case, the White House said to us, we probably shouldn't have built all the units until we figured out <laughs> what it would take to get people to go to them. Good. Um, but, but it was an amazing story. And there, was a, there were a few weeks where the largest number of deaths to, e to Ebola in Liberia, which is the only one of the three countries we worked in, the largest number of deaths were local taxi drivers. 
because they were being called on to take these families with two or three people literally bleeding out of every orifice crowded into the cab. Yeah. And who was the person who got sick who hadn't been sick before was the driver. Mm. So for me, again, I just want to keep going back to this. And you know, you asked sort of what's Jewish about this. So some people know, you know the most commonly said Jewish prayer begins with the word Shema, or listen. And we've actually taken that to heart at AJWS to say we are going to listen to the people we want to help because over and over again, they have ideas that make a difference. You talked about, about fishing and what fisher people need to learn. And I agree with you. That's part of what they need to learn to be successful. But in Kenya, the Ethiopian government and the Kenyan government signed an agreement to build a dam that would have, would have, here's the good news, development, we're all for development, would have produced hydropower for that region. But the hydropower would have been produced, and it may still be produced, I'm sorry to say, at the cost of a dam that lowers the water in, the lake, in Lake Turkana by 30 feet. That will put the people who use that lake for fishing, for herding, for feeding their cattle, and for farming out of livelihoods and out of life. And that's 400,000 indigenous tribes people. So we have, we have a local activist who's stopped the dam right now and stopped World Bank funding for the dam right now and is now organizing with the help now of the United Nations mm -hmm. to see if Ethiopia and Kenya can agree on a different proposal that will bring hydropower without destroying people's lives. But there's no way and no reason, reason why the, the, some person at some desk in, in the State Department or USAID um, or, I want to say, any one of our religious organizations would know that only sitting stateside. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's the question of listening, letting people drive their own efforts at social change, um, and then partnering with those that will create change, for sure, going back to the last panel. It will create change, and some of that change will be people as it were, organizing against some provisions of how they were raised, some provisions of their culture, but doing it, for example, Catherine, to, to assert the rights of women. Speaking Can of I this, yeah, 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 let me get one yeah, question. Great, we're not great, giving great. them much um, chance to ask questions. <laughs> uh, what, both of you actually have spent now many years in, in this development field. What, what's going to make a difference in addressing some of these questions. Is it a code of conduct that people talk about? Um, is it um, changing the actors? Uh, is it a revolution? What, what do you see as the most positive uh, directions that come out of your experience? Well, Kent mentioned a couple of the codes of conduct, and I think they're just fine. I think people just need to sign on to them. And, and for me, it really is, um, it's a question of looking at, uh, I want to look again at both some of the statistics that Tim offered and then your observation that despite those statistics, um, we have the power to make change. And so it's really taking step by step. What do we need? So one thing that doesn't get mentioned here, certainly something that many of our faiths teach, but that doesn't mean it gets practiced, is ending levels of greed, sorry, um, ending levels of willingness of people to keep amassing for themselves, um, to create scarcities, um, that's a tough change. But if we believe in the teachings of most of the faiths represented in, in this room and in the world, most of our faiths don't urge us to acquire all we can and uh, use it, use it um, uh, profligately. They urge us to really be thinking of the other all the time. My husband follows me around the kitchen and says, I know what you do for a living, but could you please put the plastic in the recycling bin? So, um, <laughs> you know, so all of us have, have behaviors that we, that we need to learn to change. Um, that's great, uh, so, so I think that's a piece of it. Is, um, and that goes directly, of course, Catherine, then to the, the, the question which, which I want to say. I think Pastor Warren raised well some of the problems with government aid. But I also want to say, folks, that we live in a world in which every single person in any of your faith, in any of your congregations, asked what percentage of US uh, budget goes to non-military foreign aid will guess wrong by a factor of at least 100, yeah. and probably 10,000. Yeah. When the, when the right. st study was done, this was several years ago, but a study was done, basically a, a public survey, what percentage of, your, of the US budget do you think goes for non-military foreign aid? 20%. What percentage do you think should go? Is that too high or too low? Oh, it's much too high. What percentage do you think should go? 5%. Mm -hmm. 
So the answer is still 2 tenths of 1%. <laughs> And so that has to do with how we use our government resources as well as how we use our own resources. And then we get to the question that I think Pastor Warren raised very fairly, which is if we provide more resources to make a difference in the global south, who is going to say how they're used? How are we going to remove as much as possible, this is obviously my issue for today, the power dynamic? Because if it's, if it, if it's Jews arriving, if it's Muslims arriving, you know, it's like of the Hindus who got in touch with me said, you know, speak up and say that this is predatory proselytizing. Um, so every group is aware of it. And what I love most about your doing this today is that it's sort of opening up, not a dirty little secret, but opening up something that doesn't get talked about enough. If we believe in aid, if we believe in, in helping the poorest people in the world live their lives differently, how are we going to do that? as Americans, as Americans with adherence to a particular faith in ways that remove as much as possible of the power dynamic that tells people who they need to be or what they need to swear to or where they need to sign in order to get help and simply respects them as people who, who are already running their own lives and who have new ideas for how to run their lives better. Uh, we want to uh, turn to the audience uh, in just a minute, and, and may I just ask one question that, that really builds on your comments, R Ruth, and I want to pose it to you, uh, Rick. Rick, you, you've argued eloquently for the importance of making the church central to the delivery of, of development in vulnerable contexts, uh, though one in hearing that might worry precisely because of what Ruth said, given radically unequal power dynamics, if the church becomes the vehicle for the delivery of development. Doesn't that put at least implicit, very inappropriate pressure on people who may not want to be part of the church to be part of the church just in order to receive development? And we know the concerns about Rice Christians, about material inducement. Pope Francis mm -hmm. has expressed concern about proselytism uh, as well. How, how do you respond to these, these kinds of concerns that there is inevitably going to be an inappropriate uh, pressure on people to um, to convert or well, uh, when you talk about the local congregation, one of the expressions in Africa is that the priest sleeps in the same blankets as the villagers. They're not rich, so there's no power play there. Yeah. When a church is as poor as the village, there's no power play at all. They're as poor as the villagers. And so I reject that argument that they're going to be having a power over the people because the fact is, I, I'm sorry, I just keep going back to Rwanda, but when the genocide hit in, two, in 1994, every single NGO left, including the UN. Who was left? The church. Why? Because the church is a community. You cannot do community development without houses of worship in most of the world. They are the community, whether it's a Hindu or a Muslim or Buddhist or Christian. They are the community. And to say we're going to ignore the number one pipeline to humanity is nonsense. And then to say that we're going to doubt your motives while we have our own motivations is also hypocritical. That's all I'm saying. And, and I think that's, that's a, for me, that's a, a great answer as far as it goes. But that's, again, in this struggle with the government recognizing the power of faith-based institutions to make a difference on the ground. For me, the next question, and I'm not, I'm not questioning anything you've done in Rwanda, and, it, and you know, it sounds great, but is like, what is it like from the point of view of a villager when the aid is coming from anybody, including us. Um, who are you? I mean, you, 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 this is one of the questions you were going to ask me that we didn't get to. But you know, people do ask us, who are you? What are Jews? What do you believe? And sometimes they say, is there something you want from us? And sometimes they say, um, you know, are you going to build a religious building? So obviously, they've had some experiences with strings that, that, that have. So I think it's not, it's not what we mobilize where I think the pastor is eloquent. It's like, how is that perceived from the person on the ground? That's why I asked you all to imagine in Liberia people showing up. I mean, another example would be, you mentioned um, Katrina before. So mm -hmm. 
I can't think of a disaster hitting Washington, D.C. other than politics and snow. But, um, <laughs> but let's, 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 imagine, you know, let's imagine we're living in an American city with a, with a catastrophe like, uh, you know, an earthquake on the West Coast, a, 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 a tidal wave or a hurricane. Mm -hmm. What if the situation were that the neighborhood in which you lived, I'm picking on you, um, you, were, you suddenly were told, okay, there are lots of people here without power, and we're going to be literally rowing people out. But what if you were told suddenly, and I have no idea who you are, so that's good, um, this, is an, this is an area that's been given to the Muslims to provide service. This is an area where you live in which the Buddhists will be attending to it. I promise you folks, be honest with yourselves, there would be a little bit of what, who, why, why are they coming now? It doesn't sound quite logical to us because we would expect sort of the government to come. But we all have these experiences. And so the question is, if that's true, if that's your situation, and that's who's providing the aid, are they going to provide the aid as people totally motivated, as, the, as Pastor Warren said before, by compassion? And they're never going to say to you, oh, by the way, <laughs> we're Buddhists. Oh, by the way, our synagogue is down the block. Oh, by the way, could you just join us because this is one of our five times a day to say a prayer. If they go about doing their work and they don't do anything more than say we are the people that the government or that the aid plan asked to take care of evacuation in your unit, in your, in your, in your area, hopefully you'll end up feeling comfortable. But I think we have to try really hard, and I don't think my organization ever does this well enough, but our constant challenge to ourselves is what does this look like from the point of view of the person we're trying to help? And what does that person, who by almost definition whom we bond with, is a natural leader? Well, if she's a natural leader, then how does she see herself and her life and her family and her story? And what can she tell us about what she most needs? And so last point, how then will she see American Jewish World Service? I want her to see us. I'm, I obviously have a, a, a horse in this race. I want her to see us as a people motivated by a drive to justice and not motivated by a desire to get her to change her religion or her cultural practices or her observances in order to get help from me. Thank you all very much. I mean, may I uh, now ask the audience, inspired sure. by uh, Ruth's mantra, to listen. We're going to listen to you now. Uh, we have several students uh, and others uh, with uh, microphones, so we invite you to um, uh, raise your hand. And I see a gentleman in the uh, back there whom I recognize, Jay Kansara from the Hello. Hindu American Foundation. Thank you Hello. for being here, thank Jay. You. Thank you to all. And I think, Ruth, thank you for mentioning that. I think my one of my board members had brought that point to your attention. One of the <clears throat> problems that we see at the Hindu American Foundation, and, and just yesterday this happened in Idaho where a Hindu, uh, where a Hindu priest was to give a, a prayer at the Idaho State House, and I think he did, and, but there was some objection to lawmakers. And the lawmakers then said, um, Steve Vick, Senator, I mean, he, he's made it public, his statement, so I don't have a problem saying his name, that America is a Christian nation. America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And then there's a study that comes out last week that 50, over 50% 50 of Republicans who are now the majority in the House and Senate say, and I'm not saying that the members of the House and the Senate have said this themselves, but people who espouse the Republican ideology in their political, uh, in political, um, in their political lives, they're saying that the, that they would be okay with the United States being a Christian nation. So I think the problem starts with how America views itself and how those who are coming from America view mm -hmm. the founding of our nation mm -hmm. and the found and how wh what is the space for religious freedom and the separation of church and state here at home before we go and give the world aid or food or whatever it may be because there's always going to be some power play in motion mm -hmm. whether no matter how poor the church is, if there's if they're attached to something bigger, that is always going to reflect. Mm -hmm. And so, if I would like to hear your points of Thank view you. on that. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. For, thanks for being here too. Um, I think it's important to remember that the countries that have 
had the greatest religious freedom were those who supposedly had a Christian foundation, not other religions. Because, and the reason why countries that had a Christian foundation, America is not a Christian nation now. Was it founded by people who were Christians? Well, the first people came here to leave persecution from the Church of England. They were called pilgrims. And they were, they, so on, even before the founding fathers, we had the pilgrim fathers, who were definitely Christians, who came here for Christian reasons to practice their own faith, and then they turned around and ended up persecuting the other Christians who came, like the Baptists and others. And so they, they created, uh, somebody said it earlier, who's ever in the majority tends to put down everybody else. When I go to Thailand, it doesn't bother me that there's a statue of Buddha in front of the capital. It's a Buddhist country. When I go, when I go to uh, uh, India and I see Hindu gods, it doesn't bother me. That's their heritage. When I go to any of the Muslim countries, I'm not offended that I walk in and I see a crescent moon and I see no symbols but except mosaics. They're Muslim countries. The question is not to me, what, was, what were the roots of America or any other country, but is there pr feed, pr freedom provided for all right now? That's, that's the real issue. And historically, if you want to thank anybody for religious freedom in America, you need to thank the Baptists. Because it wasn't anybody else, it was the Baptists who promoted. I used to own one of John, I mean, Thomas Jefferson's two famous letters on religious liberty. It's worth about $2 million now. Jefferson wrote two famous letters, one to the Danbury Baptists and one to the African Methodist Episcopals of Connecticut. In the Danbury Baptists, that's where he actually writes the letter and uses the phrase separation of church and state. Separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. It's in a letter to Baptists. That's where the whole idea comes from. And what Jefferson meant by separation of church and state is the exact opposite of what people think it means today. What he meant was, we're going to keep government out of church's business. Not that you couldn't have a religious idea in the public square. Not that you couldn't have a religious... Everybody brings a worldview when they vote. Christianity is one worldview. It's one of many, but it is a worldview. Everybody has a worldview. And what we need is to provide that everybody's worldview is allowed at the table. And in a d democracy, nobody wins all the time. I happen to be against abortion, but it's legal in America right now. I'm not leaving the country for it. I believe it's wrong, but I, I'm, it, it's not, it, it, you know, I, you don't, nobody wins all the time. And, and so in, in the letter that I owned, uh, Jefferson wrote in this letter, the dearest provision in the Constitution is that which protects the freedom of conscience and religion and government, basically, I'm paraphrasing, should totally stay out of it. it. And it was basically, now, he wrote that letter on a Friday. That Sunday, he went to church, as was his custom. Now, Jefferson was in no sense Christian. No way. But he did go to church. And he went to church which had been planted in the Capitol and met in the Capitol for eight years, in the Capitol building. So the man who wrote the phrase separation of church and state had no problem with the church being planted in the Capitol building of the United States. His, his idea of separation of church and state was so foreign to that. And so we've gone a long way from that. I think what we need is, again, and this is why I believe in what Tim is doing here, what Tom is doing here in the Religious Freedom Project, is we need to understand that this is the fundamental principle of America. It is not by accident that religious liberty is called the first freedom of America. It's not the second, it's not the third, it's not the fifth, it's the first. Religious freedom is the first phrase of the first sentence of the first paragraph of the First Amendment of the United States. It's not, it comes before freedom of the press. It comes before freedom of speech. It comes before the right to assemble. Why? Because if you don't have the right to practice and believe what you want to believe, you don't need the freedom of speech. You don't need the freedom of the press. You don't need freedom of assemble. 
the, real, the freedom to practice and propagate your religion is the fundamental thing that makes diff America different than every other country in the world. No other country was founded, no other country was founded on the idea that everybody has a right to believe what they want to believe, and you have a right to persuade me, and I have a right to persuade you. We do not have a right to coerce each other. Ruth, well, I want to go back to, yeah. to where the questioner started, and I want to go back to the beginning of my statement. I am from a group that over, his, over millennia um, was, a, was a religious minority that suffered persecution from people who said, we're all tolerant here, you can be whatever you want, but by the way, if you keep being who you are, you're likely to get yourself in increasing amounts of trouble. And the example that you gave um, from whatever state we're talking Idaho. about, Idaho, yeah. is like common, and believe it or not, I went through it in New York. I mean, I know, I'm, I know it's been a long time since I was in government, but when I was in the city council, we had to say, this is not a Christian city, this is not a Christian country. Um, this is a country that aspires to religious freedom, and if it aspires to religious freedom, and it also chooses, which I think is the first question, but if it also chooses to have a prayer at the beginning of a legislative session, then it has got to respect every religion in the city and every prayer group that anybody wants to have lead it without those kinds of objections. So I'm very sympathetic to the way in which you raise the issue. And Pastor, I want to say I love much of your version of American history, but those pilgrims who were escaping to establish religious freedom beat up on a very large nation of Native Americans who had their own religion and were persecuted and well, killed I'm in the process. I'm not defending them, but I am, I, am saying, I am saying this. No country has ever established freedom of religion that was dominated by any other religion than Christianity. None. I say that without fear of being, uh, and, and as was said earlier, and it is true that, for instance, even today, Israel is more like Egypt. Somebody said that. Yeah, but some of us think, but, but assuming for a minute, and I don't have the base to challenge the fact of mm -hmm. what you said, I want to challenge the notion that that's a good idea. What, I'm religious not, freedom? No, religious freedom is a great idea, oh. but I want to challenge the notion that it's only in countries that are predominantly Christian that religious freedom re really flourishes. When I go to Guatemala and the group that I'm working with, a group of, of uh, midwives who are changing birth practices, says, would you mind if we began with a Mayan ceremony of candle lighting? I don't say to them, okay, but only if we can also light candles on Shabbat. I say, we would love to participate with you. And so I want to see more That's and more countries, more and more countries, whatever their dominant religion, being able to cope with the, the modernity that, that Tim described. And as the world gets increasingly religiously di di diverse and increasingly pluralistic, figures out a way for everyone to live together in any one of these countries, whether it's a Muslim country, a Hindu country, a Jewish country, a Christian country, or whatever. Let's try to get a couple more questions. And yeah, there's a questioner at the back. Hi, my name is Carrie Devra, and I founded God in the Tem Temples of Government a decade ago after Van Orden versus Perry. 27 of my pictures rocked the location of faith in the Capitol. Can you can and, I ask you to hold the mic a little closer? Sorry about that. And my images appeared in the case Van Orden versus Perry, which was the right to keep Ten Commandments on the grounds in Texas. Um, I'm a sepharet, which means I'm a Hebrew calligrapher. And the core of the Bible, I believe, and our our codus for living by is in the Hebrew letters in their creation. And on this paper, I laid out two letters. The first one is known as the letter Gimel. The second one is known as the letter Dalit. And this is the lesson of charity, that the man giving charity, the gomel, the businessman, is supposed to walk after the Dalit, the poor. But you can notice that the Dalit is not looking at the man who's giving the charity. The purpose is that charity is supposed to be given anonymously and is not to embarrass people. And I think it's so important when faith is brought into a conversation of how charity is done, and there's a reference historically back to the origins that we start here. And, and Ms. Marshall, in terms of the CODIS, it does exist. In marketing, we would call it bullet points. In faith, we call it Ten Commandments. Thank you. Okay, let's get another question in, uh, yeah, right here in the front here, uh, in the middle, Sam Mall. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> Try to be very brief, because we have only a couple of minutes left. Uh, very uh, insightful, vibrant discussion. Uh, thank you very much, all you 
panelists, and I, because, you're, because of the time considerations, I just want to quickly, uh, you guys have done tremendously and moved the discussion further. The earlier two panels, I felt uh, that there was too much reference given only to the medieval church, the, the, the Mother Teresa, the Christianity, and others uh, as being the agents for proselytizing in the world. Uh, and, and the entire uh, emphasis was on Christians doing that. Uh, for one thing, I am uh, a little unhappy to see that I don't see any Muslim scholar among the panelists here mm. today. I wish we had some Muslim scholar here. I am a Christian. Yeah. My name is if, Sam Ma. If, if you can come quickly to a question. The question that is that uh, I think we should have also discussed that there are only two religions in this world. One is Christianity, other is Islam, that are in this business of spreading the gospel that they believe in. And from what I have heard from the, the people here and the organizers, that it is only the Christians who are guilty of this and not the others. If we look around, open our eyes, I think we will find that over the last 13 centuries, there have been a lot of uh, issues on the same subject. Even today, as we talk of Boko Haram and ISIS, and there is no reference being. Please understand, I am the director of the Muslim Christian Interfaith yeah. Federation here in the USA. So my, our, uh, our this thing, best man was also Muslim. I am born and raised mm -hmm. in Pakistan. So please understand, there, yeah. this, Thank I'm you, not Sam. coming from it. Mm -hmm. But I think this is something that is a miss. Thank uh, you. And we should have paid more attention to this. I think it was made, the point was made that several, many groups have proselytized across history, but I think we could have done a better job of talking about the variety of proselytism. We do uh, need to come to uh, a close, I'm afraid. I'd like to give our panelists an uh, opportunity to offer closing uh, comments. Uh, and uh, then we'll uh, take a short break before our uh, uh, last panel of the day. Yeah, R uh, Ruth and then Rick. Um, I, I really want to be very brief. First of all, you've been a wonderful audience. And second of all, I think we've actually, um, uh, Pastor Warren and I have shared a great deal of what we each think and not given Catherine and um, Tim maybe enough time to ask the questions that they <laughs> plan to ask us. Um, but I just would love to um, urge people who have an interest in exploring this more, it's not a question of looking me up, although I'm happy to give you my card, but I'm mostly asking you to just sort of think about this in terms of the work that you do. And think about how you think about, in theory, the other person, the person next to you, the person in your congregation or your faith-based community, and extend that same thinking to the people wherever it is that you are doing social change work, um, justice work, charitable work, and be sure you equally see them as people in control of their own destiny. Good, good Thank word. You. Thank you, Ruth. Good word. Rick. Um, my final word would simply be coercion is not conversion. They are not the same. It's not conversion unless I choose. I believe that God gives me the right to accept or reject him, and so I must give that right to everybody else to accept or reject him. That, that's, that's where I, I stand from. And so I am absolutely opposed to con coercion. I'm absolutely opposed, opposed to strings attached and all of these kind of things. But I do believe in sharing what I deeply hold, and I make no apology in that. If I'm a doctor and somebody comes to me with a cut arm and all they want is a Band-Aid. I give them a Band-Aid. But if I discover they have cancer too, it is unethical for me to send them off with a Band-Aid. And I believe uh, Jesus told me to love your neighbor as yourself, treat everybody with dignity, love everybody, and share the good news. I believe in both the good news and the common good. And I think you can hold both in balance. Thank you. Thank you, Rick Warren. Thank you, Ruth Messenger, for sharing so profoundly.